July 6, 1962, Naval Facility Barbados. In a windowless room built to look ordinary from the outside, U.S. Navy analysts watched a faint, steady trace form on a paper display. There was no periscope sighting, no radar return, no dramatic sonar ping from a destroyer. Just a low-frequency pattern arriving from far beyond the horizon, carried through the deep sound channel of the Atlantic. When the report was logged and passed onward, the implication was simple and unsettling. A Soviet nuclear submarine had been detected entering the Atlantic through the Greenland, Iceland, United Kingdom gap. For Soviet naval planners, the nuclear submarine promised distance and invisibility. A boat could leave the Kola Peninsula, slip beneath storms and darkness, and still threaten an opponent's sea lanes or hold a strategic target at risk. The credibility of that threat depended on one assumption. The ocean was vast enough to hide in. But by the early 1960s, the United States was quietly building something that challenged that assumption. It was not a new torpedo or a faster submarine. It was an undersea surveillance architecture of fixed hydrophone arrays linked by cable to shore processing sites, concealed behind the cover name Project Caesar and publicly described as oceanographic work. The operating logic was straightforward and difficult to defeat. Low-frequency sound can travel enormous distances in the ocean when it couples into the SOFAR channel. A submarine does not need to be loud in the everyday sense to be detected at these ranges. Machinery vibrations, propeller blade rates, reduction gears, and other persistent sources create patterns that skilled analysts can distinguish from the surrounding noise. At the shore station, signal processing translated that noise into a display where bearings could be inferred, tracks could be refined, and contacts could be held long enough to cue aircraft or surface ships for localization. The ocean, in effect, became an information system. The strategic contrast was sharp. The Soviet Navy invested in steel, reactors, and crews to gain stealth at sea. The United States invested in physics, cables, and analysts to make the sea less opaque. Early detections did not mean every submarine was vulnerable at every moment, but they proved a decisive point. The North Atlantic was not an empty hiding place. It was a medium that could be instrumented, monitored, and exploited. In the next section, we will follow how this shift moved from isolated detections into a sustained operational pattern, and why that pattern hit Soviet admirals as more than an embarrassment, because it threatened the logic of deterrence itself. That threat to deterrence was not theoretical, because the Greenland-Iceland-United Kingdom gap was more than a map feature. It was a practical funnel. Soviet submarines based on the Kola Peninsula and operating from the Barents Sea had limited routes into the wider Atlantic that did not run close to NATO airfields, surface patrol areas, and choke points. The GIUK gap became the main corridor, and choke points are exactly where fixed sensors are most valuable. SOSIS was never a single wall that saw everything, but rather a network of bottom-mounted hydrophone arrays placed to take advantage of geography, ocean acoustics, and likely transit routes with shore processing nodes on both sides of the Atlantic. As Soviet nuclear submarine operations expanded in the 1960s and early 1970s, especially with the rise of ballistic missile submarines meant to guarantee a second strike capability, the United States faced a practical question. Could it hold a continuous picture of Soviet undersea movements long enough to make that force predictable? The answer, increasingly, was that the first step did not require a destroyer to stumble onto a target. It required early warning and persistent tracking cues. SOSIS provided that cueing function. When a contact was established at long range, it could be handed off to mobile forces for refinement. Maritime patrol aircraft such as the P-3 Orion using sonobuoys, surface combatants with towed arrays as they matured, and U.S. attack submarines trained to take over a trail quietly once the general track was known. For Soviet admirals, the operational effect felt like humiliation because it inverted the expected sequence. In Soviet doctrine, the submarine should be the hunter and the surface force the hunted. Yet in the North Atlantic, Soviet boats often discovered that NATO forces appeared where they shouldn't have been if the ocean were truly opaque. The reality was that long-range detection compressed the search problem. Instead of scanning enormous areas at random, NATO could concentrate resources along a predicted track, turning what looked like chance encounters into managed intercepts. This mattered even more for strategic forces. Ballistic missile submarines were designed to be survivable precisely because they were hard to find. 
If an adversary could routinely establish initial contact near transit routes, then the burden shifted onto the submarine to evade from the moment it left safer waters. The sea still contained uncertainty, but the direction of advantage was changing. In the contest between platform performance and information architecture, SOSIS made information the first mover. And once that lesson sank in, Soviet leadership began searching for explanations that went beyond better luck, because an empire that funds a nuclear deterrent cannot accept the idea that its core weapon system is being tracked by routine. Inside the Soviet Navy, the first reaction was rarely to accept a single elegant explanation. There were too many moving parts and too much at stake. Commanders knew that Western Maritime Patrol aircraft had improved, that NATO had forward bases, and that American attack submarines were skilled. But none of that fully explained why initial contacts seemed to occur so consistently near the same corridors, or why localization sometimes followed with unusual speed. The more troubling possibility was that the West had shifted from searching for submarines to managing information about submarines. This is where SOSIS created a psychological effect as well as an operational one. A hunter can tolerate being chased if the chase is occasional. What breaks confidence is the sense that the environment itself is betraying you. Fixed arrays on the seabed do not tire, they do not need refueling, and they do not depend on a patrol schedule. Their value lies in persistence. Even when they did not deliver a perfect track, they could provide time, bearing, and pattern cues that reduced uncertainty for every other asset in the chain. And once a cue existed, NATO could choose when to invest more effort and when to hold back, preserving the advantage of surprise. Soviet planners responded in two main directions. The first was technical, make submarines quieter, and change the acoustic signature that long-range systems were trained to recognize. Quieting was not a single upgrade but an industrial campaign, involving improved machining tolerances, isolation mounts, better propeller design to reduce cavitation, and machinery changes intended to flatten distinctive blade rate tones. This was expensive, slow, and uneven across classes, but it reflected an admission that the undersea contest was increasingly a contest of signatures. The second response was doctrinal. Reduce exposure to choke points and operate where fixed surveillance was less advantageous. That logic fed directly into the bastion concept that emerged more clearly in the late Cold War, with strategic submarines protected closer to Soviet territory under layered defenses, rather than routinely pushing into the open Atlantic. From a Soviet perspective, it was a rational adaptation. From an American perspective, it was a strategic victory, because it constrained Soviet options and concentrated their most important submarines into areas that could be monitored by other means. But even these adaptations raised a harder question. If the West's advantage came partly from knowing when and where to listen, then any compromise of communications and procedures could turn acoustic detection from a possibility into near certainty. By the late 1960s and into the 1970s, the Soviet Navy was confronting a layered problem, acoustics, geography, and intelligence. SOSIS could provide long-range indications, but turning those indications into confident intercepts depended on context. Knowing when a submarine left port, which route it was likely to take, what mission profile it was executing, and how NATO units were positioned all shaped how aggressively the United States could exploit an initial detection. This is where a separate Cold War reality became decisive, signals intelligence. In 1967, U.S. Navy Chief Warrant Officer John Anthony Walker began passing cryptographic materials to the Soviet Union, and his espionage continued for years before his arrest in 1985. The materials he compromised included keying information used with U.S. Navy communication systems. For Soviet planners, this was a gift because it reduced uncertainty about American intentions, procedures, and sometimes operational patterns. It did not switch off SOSIS, nor did it grant Soviet submarines invisibility, but it affected the decision cycle. If the Soviets could better infer how the U.S. Navy operated, they could adjust routes, timing, and expectations. Even the knowledge that American communications were vulnerable encouraged both sides to rethink what the other might know. The important contrast is that SOSIS represented physics-based detection, while cryptographic compromise represented information access. One made the ocean more transparent. The other made the opponent's coordination more legible. Together, they reinforced a core lesson of the Cold War undersea contest. 
the decisive edge often came less from a single platform and more from the integration of sensing, processing, and command decisions. A faint acoustic line on a shore station display became far more valuable when it could be matched to a likely departure, a predicted corridor, and a readiness posture for maritime patrol aircraft and attack submarines. For Soviet admirals, that integration produced the fear that their most expensive assets could be placed into a narrowing funnel of predictability. They could invest in quieter propellers and better mounts, but they could not easily change the geography of the North Atlantic and they could not assume that procedures alone would protect them if Western systems were combining multiple streams of evidence. And as the 1970s moved toward the peak of superpower naval competition, the contest shifted from, can you hear me, to the harder question that followed. Once you can hear me, how long can you keep me, and what does that let you do? What SOSIS ultimately threatened was not just a single patrol, but the logic of sea denial and nuclear survivability. A ballistic missile submarine is not meant to fight its way to a target. It is meant to endure, to remain unlocated, and to preserve a retaliatory option. When an adversary can establish early indications of where that submarine is moving, the submarine's mission changes. It becomes a continuous evasion problem, starting near home waters and continuing through every predictable transit corridor. That does not guarantee a kill, but it changes the balance of risk, and in deterrence, perceived risk is sometimes as influential as proven capability. This is why the Soviet response became so broad. Quieting campaigns accelerated, and newer Soviet boats aimed to erase the most distinctive tonal features that fixed arrays and analysts relied upon. Design improvements reduced machinery resonance and improved propulsor efficiency. At the same time, Soviet commanders adapted operational patterns. Some deployments emphasized operating under ice or within more protected maritime zones. The Bastion idea, supported by surface ships, aircraft, and coastal defenses, sought to create a defensible sanctuary rather than a long transoceanic infiltration. The implication was sobering. A system built by the United States to watch the open Atlantic was helping to push Soviet strategic forces back toward the periphery. On the American side, SOSIS also shaped doctrine. It encouraged a layered approach where fixed systems provided broad surveillance and queuing, while mobile forces provided classification and attack capability. Maritime patrol aircraft expanded their role, not as random searchers, but as rapid responders to acoustic queuing. Surface ships with improved sonar systems and later towed arrays became more relevant because they could be vectored into likely intercept zones. Most critically, American attack submarines became the quiet instruments that could take a general track and turn it into a sustained trail, sometimes for days, building a picture of Soviet operations that fed both wartime planning and peacetime intelligence. The deeper consequence was that undersea warfare became less about isolated engagements and more about systems engineering. The weapon was the ability to detect, process, classify, and act faster than the opponent could adapt. For Soviet admirals, this meant their fleet was competing not only against other submarines, but against a network that reached from the seabed to shore stations to patrol aircraft, to command centers making decisions based on a growing library of signatures and patterns. As the Cold War approached its final decade, the ocean remained vast, but the invisible contest had matured. The question was no longer whether the sea could hide a submarine, but whether any submarine could remain hidden from a patient system designed to listen all the time. The legacy of SOSIS did not end with a single set of Cold War installations, because the underlying principle outlived the political era that produced it. Fixed arrays were only one expression of a broader idea. Combine ocean acoustics, persistent sensors, and disciplined analysis to turn an environment once defined by uncertainty into a space where patterns could be detected and exploited. Over time, the United States and its allies improved mobile surveillance with better towed arrays, quieter platforms, improved processing, and wider integration of intelligence sources. At the same time, Russia and later other navies absorbed the lesson that silence is not just a technical specification, but a strategic requirement. That is why the phrase, the ocean turned against them, is not just metaphor. In the Cold War, Soviet admirals had to reckon with a world where their submarines might be detected not by a nearby hunter, but by the ocean carrying their own machinery noise across hundreds of miles to a shore station. They could build new hulls and reactors, but they could not repeal the physics of low-frequency propagation. They could shift doctrine toward bastions and under-ice operations, 
but those shifts were themselves evidence that the open Atlantic had become a more dangerous place for a force that depended on invisibility. The modern parallel is that this contest is returning in new forms. Today's submarines are far quieter than their early nuclear predecessors, and detection is harder, not easier. Yet the logic of persistent sensing has expanded into new domains. Seabed systems, distributed networks, improved data processing, and the fusion of acoustic clues with other indicators. The details are often classified, but the direction is consistent with the Cold War pattern. Undersea Advantage is increasingly built from networks and analysis rather than from a single heroic platform. For viewers trying to understand why this matters, the lesson is simple. During the Cold War, SOSIS did not win the undersea war by itself. It changed the terms of competition. It forced the Soviet Navy to spend vast resources on quieting and on defensive doctrine, and it gave the United States an information advantage that influenced planning, patrols, and crisis stability. In a contest where minutes mattered and uncertainty was dangerous, the side that could listen first often shaped what happened next. If you want more Cold War technology stories told with this same documentary approach, make sure to like the video, subscribe, and turn on notifications, because the next episode will go deeper into how undersea detection and deception evolved when both sides realized the sea was no longer a guaranteed hiding place.